All right, good evening. Going to be breaking bread, thinking about the third letter of John. And there's some really profound things here, but you've got to you've got to poke somewhat beneath the surface to find them. So we'll ask for the Lord's help in doing that. Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we come to your word, and above all, we come to your Son, whom we are here to remember. And Father, we pray that you will open our eyes, that we might see the wonderful things that, of your word, that we might behold wonderful things out of your law. Help us, Father, and guide us to understand rightly, and especially guide us towards seeing the Lord Jesus as the preeminent one, as the ultimate truth and reality in our lives. Help us, Father, in our weakness, in our tendency to be distracted from him and not to have him as the ultimate truth and the ultimate light by which and in whose light we understand all things in this world. We pray, Heavenly Father, then, that he truly, he there crucified for me, might be the light in which I understand my life, this world, my path in this world. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will guide each and every one of us, especially those who are distracted at this point, in their journey by sickness, by illness, by the situation in the world around them, by persecution, by depression, by frustration, by terrible domestic situations, by abuse, by suffering in their own families, those who <clears throat> are near and dear to them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will strengthen each of us to see in Jesus the ultimate truth, the ultimate light, and to be guided by him towards the life eternal, when the darkness shall pass away, and there shall be no night there, but only <clears throat> the light of your glory and the light of your Son. Hear us, Father, please, for his sake. Amen. So, John had preached the gospel, and if you want a transcript of how he used to preach the gospel, you've got it, inspired, in the Gospel of John. And so years had passed, and he was now writing to communities of people that he baptized and nurtured, etc. And that's where first and second and third of John, that's where these letters come from. They are missionary documents in that sense. And he's writing here, verse 1, to Gaius, and he calls himself the elder. And it really means the father. I'm your father, spiritually. And he goes on to say that I, I'm delighted to, to hear how well you're going. In verse 3, I rejoice greatly when brothers came and testified to the truth which is in you. And I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. So then these children were his converts. And you may have not had children. And you may dearly wish that you had had children or that you could have children. Or maybe you had children and, well, it didn't quite go as you expected. You have disappointment. Or, in whatever sense, you feel that you want to be somebody for someone else, whatever happened in your domestic life. Well, by caring for people spiritually, you become naturally a father to those people. They become your children. You take Paul and Timothy. Timothy was not baptized by Paul, but Paul refers to him as his child in the faith because he'd had this big formative influence upon Timothy's spiritual growth. It's the same with John here with these folks that he's writing to and when he hears that they are walking in truth, he says, I've got no greater joy, no greater joy. There is no greater joy than actually having spiritual children who you see holding on, even if many fall away, but some hold on. There is, there's nothing like it. There is no life better than that. That is the eternal joy, because as Paul says about his converts to the Philippians, you, in the day of judgment, you are our glory and our joy. It says the same to the Thessalonians. To see those that you've labored for in the kingdom of God, well, you're going to be a happy man forever, whereas... Yeah, there is the assumption in secular life that having physical children is the be-all and end-all of life. That is the basically most significant thing you can do 
in this world, but it actually isn't because it's only for this life. And they may or may not choose to go in God's way. You can only set children on a path, but there has to be human volition, human free will. So you can do this. You may say, but how can I do it? Yeah, you can. You online even can get really involved with people. And I don't mean just a few passing messages now and again. I mean the seriously pastoring people over the long run, over not just weeks but months, and not just months but years and years, even decades. They do become your spiritual children. But as with any form of parenthood, that's a responsibility that you take. And in that responsibility, there is this joy when you see some walking in the truth and keeping on. Now, when he keeps talking about the truth here in his writings, Gaius, whom I love in truth, verse 1, and I rejoice greatly when brethren testify to the truth which is in you, you're walking in truth and my children walk in the truth. I suggest that John, in his writings, uses the truth in the same way as Paul uses the term in Christ. John's Gospel has defined the truth as the Lord Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when he talks about walking in truth, I don't think he simply means that you are correctly understanding the Bible on every academic point. He's talking about life lived, walking, daily life in Christ and the truth. Christ, the Lord Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Truth, which John has spoken so much about or recorded so much about in the Comfort of Passages, three whole chapters, John 14 to 16, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Christ. If that is in somebody who you've mentored, if you see that the Spirit of Christ is in them, that's a success. That is a tick. That is, well, you've got no greater joy. And if they walk like that to their grave and you bury them or, and you pass to them until they fall asleep in Jesus and you know they've got the Spirit of Christ, that is the ultimate experience. And we can all be involved in this. This is the trouble with the idea of some people being a pastor and other people just being the attendees at the meeting at the church. No, we are all in this. We are a priesthood. We are all priests. First of Peter 2 is very clear about that. But we are a priesthood, all of us. Not just some, not just one tribe of Israel, but all of us are priests. So, he says in verse 2, I pray that in all things you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. I don't think he's wishing him simply good health and general prosperity. I think the idea when, when he says even as your soul prospers is kathos in, uh, in New Testament Greek. The, the idea is <clears throat> I, I pray that in all things you may prosper and be in health according to the prospering of your soul. So I think he's saying that it's your spiritual prosperity and spiritual health that is all things to me. That's what I'm concerned with. And I think he's kind of um, deconstructing the standard opening of letters because in those days people wrote a letter like this and they always said, I, I really hope that your health is good and that you're you know, materially prospering, all's going well on the farm and all, whatever, all that sort of thing, your business is, is good. Well, he says, look, I pray above all things for your spiritual prosperity and your spiritual health because, as he's going to say in verse 4, I've got no greater joy than to know my children, spiritual children, walk in truth in Christ with the Spirit of Christ. That is his point. And above all things, that is what you want for somebody. Christianity is not contrary to how it is peddled these days by many people about health and wealth. Actually, I would argue it's actually about not having health and wealth and losing it all, which you're going to do anyway when you die. Uh, that's, that's what happens at the end of the, when the game's over. It's not about that. Above all things, it is about your spiritual health and prosperity. And it's a good perspective here that he gives. Well, he's writing here to Gaius. 
Gaius is one of the most common names in the Roman Empire. There are three people called Gaius in the New Testament, but I reckon this is just a, a standard name. Because, well, I say it's one of the most common names in the Roman Empire. I mean, they've, they've looked at all these inscriptions. There's a huge wealth of material from first century Roman Empire, and they've looked through it and noticed what names were the most popular names. Gaius was very, very common, one of the most common names. It's like, you know, writing a letter to Jose in Mexico. Well, <laughs> there's, a, there's a billion Jose's in, in, in Mexico. Uh, or Dave in, Dave in London, or, or, you know, John in Sydney, or whatever it might be, or Vladimir in, in, in Russia. It's so common that you get the impression that actually the bigger picture here is that this is for every man, that Gaius is, is every man, that, that it's, it's us. Right, well, he, he goes on and says, verse 5, you're doing a faithful work, toward those that are brothers, especially because they're strangers. Brothers. And he's saying that you are doing the right thing in entertaining these brothers. Now, we're going to read about these brothers a bit later with the Diotrephes, who says, we're told in verse 10, that he does not welcome the brothers. And those that would, he forbids and throws them out of the church. So it's the same group of brothers. Gaius welcomed these brothers, although they were strangers, didn't know them, possibly idea being they were Gentiles, and he was a Jewish Christian, but he had them into his home. And you know from Acts 10 with Peter and Cornelius that for Jews to have Gentiles into their home and entertain them and so on was not acceptable. It was not okay in Jewish culture. But Gaius did accept these brothers into his home, and he brought them on their way. We're told, set them forward, verse 6, on their journey in a manner worthy of God. And these people, these brothers, had gone back to John's church and testified of what had happened. And John was very happy about this. But Diotrephes, verse 10, who loved to have the preeminence, prating against us, that's John, with wicked words, not content therewith, neither does he welcome the brothers, these brothers he's talking about, and those that would, that's Gaius, he forbids and throws them out of the church. So Gaius had been thrown out of the church by Diotrephes because he entertained and materially supported these brothers who had come from John's church. Now let's find a bit more about them. Verse 7, because for the sake of the name they went forth. For the sake of the name they went forth. Well, I take that as an allusion to the Great Commission. That repentance and forgiveness of sins, Luke 24, Luke's version of it, should be preached in his name, beginning at Jerusalem. So, they had gone forth in obedience to the Great Commission. And Gaius had accepted them into his home, brought them on their journey, which means he gave them food, and maybe a bit of cash, for the next stage of their missionary journey. And he says, verse, eight, verse uh, 8, We therefore ought to welcome such, that we may be fellow workers for the truth, for Jesus. Well, fellow workers. Well, Gaius was sitting in his home, entertained these brethren, helped them out materially as far as he could, and, and they went on. He was a fellow worker. He played his part in the Great Commission by supporting these missionary brethren. And it was, if you like, chalked up to him. He was a worker but he didn't move, as far as we know, out of his house. And we can be like that as well, not supporting missionary work just out of a sense of guilt, or I suppose I ought to, but you can actually be involved in the Great Commission. It says that. You are a fellow worker by supporting these who did go forth for the sake of the name. They went forth. Go into all the world. Go forth into all the world. Preach the gospel. That is what they were doing. So, he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, verse 9, who loves to have the preeminence, does not welcome us, that is John. So, John was an inspired apostle, don't forget. 
and Diotrephes didn't want him. Now, Diotrephes means literally one raised, one brought up by God, one trained by God from, from childhood, one who'd been raised by God. Dios Trephes, that's the idea. One that was raised by God. Someone who had been schooled in the ways of God from childhood. Possibly he was Jewish, although all these names are, are sort of Latinized, kind of Roman names. Possibly he, he was Jewish. And he didn't like the idea of having these Gentiles, especially if they were going out fulfilling the Great Commission, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He didn't like the idea of having these guys in his home, as he saw it. And he loved to have the preeminence. Well, very clearly, especially when you read Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the Lord Jesus is presented as the one who is preeminent. But Diotrephes, although he was technically a Christian and an elder of this synonymous church, didn't see Jesus as preeminent. He didn't see the lordship of Jesus. He wanted to be the preeminent one. And I think John Shirley has in view the Lord's words that whoever wishes to be first shall be last of all. You've got to want to be last, and then you'll become first in the kingdom. So the idea is that this Diotrephes, this elder, is in fact, because he wants to be preeminent, is in fact last of all. He is actually very weak spiritually. And, well, he was saying that, look, if you accept these missionary brethren, especially the Gentiles, they're not in fellowship, they're obeying this great commission, which you don't, you're not supposed to do it like that, you're not supposed to go and preach to Gentiles. If you have them in your home, or if you in some way support them, I will chuck you out of the church. And that's what had happened to Gaius. And this is why John's writing to him, comforting him. Well, that's what happened. Very human. I don't normally give personal asides in my talks, but I'll give you one here for a reason. When I was a young man, teenager, I looked at the Great Commission and I wondered, if, does this apply to me? Does this apply to us generally in this world? And what was the content of that Great Commission? The Lord says, you know, I've risen from the dead, now go and tell this to everybody. This is the gospel, preach to them, baptize them, and, uh, and teach them all things that I've commanded you. And I wondered, what is the content of this gospel, and does it apply to me personally? As a young man, I came to the conclusion that it did apply to me. And that in my, according to the frames of my own uh, limitation, I should devote myself to that. And despite many, many failures, morally, spiritually, you name it, uh, imperfections in the imitation of the Lord Jesus, I, I did give my life to that. And I'm going to look back on, you know, 40 years, and I did. Uh, yeah, I, I did go that way. And what, what, what did I find? Yeah, I baptized people. And, they, and I bumped into people like Diotrephes. What I'm reading here, what I'm reading, is the story of my life. That some dominant individual, who was respected in his church, prated, as he says here, with wicked words against me, slandered me, did me down. Anybody I'd baptised, out. Anybody wants to support those who I've baptised, out. Forbids them and throw, forbids them from helping those who are doing this work of the gospel and throws them out of the church. This is what I saw in my life for 40 years. But in those 40 years, I was 35 years, 40 years, whatever. In those years, I was reading 3rd John. I've always been quite a fan of the Bible Companion. And in that reading table, you read 3rd John twice a year. Oh, well, years I used it, years I didn't. I probably did read this text at least twice a year. And it wasn't until well, many years, decades of reading this that it suddenly came true for me. And I suddenly saw it. All the pain I had because of people like Diotrephes, 
of pain for other people as I saw them being cast out of the church and all this sort of thing. Yeah, suddenly I saw it. This is exactly what I'm going for. Now, I said I don't like personal asides. What I want to say to you is this, that there are st the stuff that you've g gone through and are going through in your life. And those things are not without precedent. When you read the Bible, it is pretty well, you could say, nearly all of it, apart from possibly the law of Moses, is all biography. It is about people. It is about people. Really? And we all like reading biography because you start to see something of yourself in that person. When you look at the Bible, you think, why were these incidents chosen? Why were these people chosen? There was loads of believers, uh, but only a few of them, relatively speaking, are recorded in the Bible. And when you read the accounts of their lives, you only inevitably only read a few snatches of something that happened in Abraham's life, and then 30 years later you read something else happened, you don't read what happened in between. It's not you know, a detailed biography, but it is biography. And it's about people. Simplest term. Why did God make the choices that he did? And I think this is the reason. So that this wonderful book, the Bible, it becomes a living word. A living word. That it is not a dead letter, but God's word comes alive. When you start to see, whoa, this is me. When previously you thought, well, nobody understands. I cannot explain. You would not understand. I'm sure that we have all felt that. I can explain. I won't explain you. I won't start. Because you would not understand. Or oh, you're my friend and you, you know, you're you my mate and all that. We've all gone through that. And that is what it is to be human. That is what it is to have life experience. That is what it is to suffer. But you see, where it gets so onerous and so <clears throat> burdensome is when you feel it is so unique that what I went through, what I go through is without precedent. It is not without precedent. There's a beautiful little passage in Romans 14 that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. How does the Bible comfort you? In this way. If you read it sensitively and thoughtfully, you don't have to be clever or smart or whatever. Just read it or listen to it carefully, slowly and thoughtfully. You will start to see that there is an arm that comes out of Scripture and cuddles you and gives you a hug and comforts you. Well, wow, now I see it. I'll give you an example. The Lord Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days tempted, etc. He answers the temptations by quoting all the time from Deuteronomy. In fact, from a very... A uh, small part of Deuteronomy, the three quotes he makes are all from either Deuteronomy 6 or Deuteronomy 8. He's thinking, here I am, 40 days in the desert, suffer to hunger. Ah, oh, Israel, 40 years in the wilderness, suffer to hunger. Ah, oh, now I get it. And so it is with us. And so, as I say, years, decades of reading 3 John, didn't quite see it. Until one day, it was as if an arm came out of 3rd of John and was like a, gave me a cuddle. Like gave me a hug. Hey, Duncan, you are not alone. And this is, of course, the great truth. That man is not alone. You are not alone. I am not alone. Man is not alone. Sure, God is with us. Jesus is with us. But more than that, that is sort of on a kind of vertical level, but on the horizontal level, at least over history, Others have gone through, in essence, what you are going through. So quit all the thinking that my position, my situation, nobody could imagine, nobody could understand. I can't explain. You would not understand. Sure, you would not understand. But in the scriptures, there is this comfort, comfort of the scriptures. But 
God works to patterns. And he sees his children all different, but all passing through the same patterns. So this, this brief little letter, this whole business about Diotrephes, the one who grew up with God, who had been brought up in the truth, but didn't get it, who didn't see Jesus as preeminent, who was legalistic. We don't want all these uh, Gentiles, these strangers coming in, and if you support that missionary work, you're out of the church. Oh, bang, church divides, people disillusioned, families break up, people losing their faith. Yeah, and the hatred against John, yeah. Yeah, I saw it. I'm telling you, this, this is... Not history. Well, it is history, but, you know, it's a living word. Absolutely a living, living word. Prating against us with wicked words. Wicked logos is actually the, the Greek there. The intention was wicked and not content therewith. He had to chuck people out of the church. Content. Same word, sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace makes you content. This Diotrephes, although Diotrephes, Diotrephes, he, he had been brought up in God, as it were, he didn't get the preeminence of Jesus. He didn't see his utter lordship before whom we fall on our knees and all interpersonal conflict and strife has to finish before the cross. Before him there, lifted up in glory, to the height of preeminence. I understand Jesus is not God. I'm landing, raving, non-Trinitarian. But he was lifted up in glory. His preeminence is such that before him every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. And we are not looking for the preeminence. Diotrephes did. And God's grace, the grace of Jesus, was not content for him, was not sufficient for him. He didn't feel content. He had to get his self-worth by kicking somebody else out, by having his bit of power in the church. Yeah. For us, we then are to follow, not him, but Obviously, the, the way of the Lord Jesus. Well, to cast someone out of the church, this is exactly the term that's used about the believers in Jesus as Messiah being cast out of the synagogue. You've got the same in John 9, where the healed blind man is cast out of the synagogue. They cast out Jesus from the vineyard of Israel. And yet, casting out, it's the same word used about rejection at the last day. They will be cast into outer darkness. Cast out. The bad fish are cast, cast away. What these people do to others by casting them out of the church, it will be done to them. I am afraid that in all intellectual, expositional honesty, that is unfortunately the conclusion. <clears throat> and he says, 11, do not imitate such evil. This is evil. And yet this guy, Diotrephes, was raised in the truth. He was Diostrephes, raised up, raised by God, in the ways of God, in the ways of the truth. And a lot of these people, they, in the end, you come to feel sorry for them. And I think that is the point, I think, of understanding and maturity. We look at these guys who are elders in their congregation, in their denomination, in their fellowship, who think that they're so you know, preeminent. And, oh, we, we must not upset Brother So-and-so, he's a very eminent brother, all this stuff. No. What they do is evil. It is evil. That is what it says here. To cast people out of the church, you don't do that. Over some argument about missionary work and who you say we should accept these brethren, we say you must not accept these brethren. You accept these brethren, well, I'll chuck you out of the church. This is evil, he says. And, you know, we, we, all I can say is that we have to give due weight, due weight to this. And don't say, oh, well, it's not me, I'm just some humble little guy. Uh, the brethren, they, the committee made the decision. No, you're all caught up in it. 
And you do, it's the simplest ethical choice, I'm afraid. Do what is right and do not do what is wrong. And do not fall for the argument that if you're truly humble, you'll just submit to what we say. No, there's nothing to do with humility. You can't say that your humility is so great that I, I had to chuck these people out of the church because I'm so humble. No, <laughs> rubbish. Absolute rubbish. That has nothing to do with it. Um, you've got to be very careful that you are not led into sin by people like Diotrephes. You've got to be very careful. So this casts them out. He throws them out of the church. That, that word, that phrase is very often used in the contemporary writings that have been found about clubs and societies. That people were, it's like a technical term, thrown out of the society, thrown out of the club, didn't keep the bylaws or didn't pay the subscription or, or whatever. So he was thrown out of the society, the club. There were lots of clubs and societies in the Roman Empire in Roman culture. There was a lot of these clubs. And I think the idea is that Diotrephes was treating the church like it was a human club, like it was a human society. And <laughs> it isn't. The body of Christ is unique. It is without parallel. It is without compare. It is different. It is bound together by the Spirit of Christ. That is the basis of unity. We are bound together by a common allegiance to having the mind of Christ. This is totally different to any human club, society, organisation in secular life. You, know, you visually appear the same that you have a building or place that you meet and, and the secretary and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, but that must not lead you to think that this that, that the church is merely a human sort of organisation. It is the body of Jesus and is governed not by your constitution, not by your bylaws, but by his. By the Sermon on the Mount. That's what it's governed by. So, <clears throat> more positively, verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate such evil, but imitate that which is good. He that does good is of God. He that does evil has not seen God. Well, how do you see God? No man can see God. But the Lord Jesus said that he who has seen me has seen the Father. Seeing in the sense of understanding, having a relationship with. So why does Diotrephes not see God? Because he didn't see Jesus. But he's an elder of the church. In this particular church, he's an elder. He's got the power to chuck people out. Yeah, but he had never seen Jesus. He didn't see Jesus as the preeminent one because he thought he was preeminent. He did not let himself be content with the grace of Jesus. That was not enough for him. It was not sufficient for him. So not being a content person, he had to find his little bit of meaning by kicking other people out. And so the idea is, do not imitate him. Take this guy, Diotrephes, as a warning of how not to be. But imitate that or him, he, that is good. Well... At first blush, you may think that is talking about God, about Jesus. And, yeah, maybe. But I think verse 12 is the answer. Demetrius has the witness of all and of the truth itself. Yes, we also testify, and you know that our witness is true. Why say those words? Why suddenly introduce Demetrius and say, oh, Demetrius, see, he's a good guy, by the way. Demetrius has the witness of all and of the truth itself. Yes, we also testify, we also know that Demetrius is, is true, and you know that our witness is true. Why start talking about another guy, another brother, Demetrius? Why well, we'll start talking about him? Well, here's my take on 3 John. 3 John is about three people. It's about three men. 3 John is about three men. Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. And Gaius, as I say, the most common Roman name, every man, every John, every Bob, you and me, is being told, do not imitate Diotrephes, but imitate Demetrius. 
I do not see the function of verse 12, unless that is the case. You see, verse 11, do not imitate such evil, but imitate he that is good. He that does good is of God, is of God. he that does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has the witness of all, and of the truth itself. Yes, we also testify, you know that our witness is true. So I think Gaius, who is us, who is every man, has the choice. Do you want to imitate Diotrephes? Or do you want to imit imitate Demetrius? Well, straight away you want to know who is Demetrius. But before we come to that, remember that these folks in the first century were largely illiterate. They were not Bible students. They didn't have access to the scriptures, to the scrolls, etc. Much of the New Testament was not in, in widespread circulation. It was all based on what you heard. And what modelled Christianity was people. And that's why very often there is exhortation to imitate good examples of people. I'll just read you a few of them. Hebrews 13. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and imitate their faith. Imitate them. Paul a couple of times says, be imitators of me. And it's this word for mimicking. Mimic me, like little child does. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, he wrote to the Thessalonians. You, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus who are in Judea. Hebrews 6, that you may be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of Abraham. So, I think that this is so, that we are to imitate people that we might imitate the Lord Jesus. And that is why example is so powerful. That is why you can become a role model to new converts very easily. It is why new converts almost naturally seem to want to call you pastor or father or something like that. And naturally, think, don't, 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 don't call me that. I'm just an ordinary guy. Uh, yeah, we are. We are ordinary guys, no, no doubt about that. Uh, but that is understandable because, well, that is actually, I'm afraid, who we are. We are their elders. It is as simple as that. And we have to act responsibly to that. Now, having said that, who was this Demetrius? Well, Bible study is a bit of a detective story, is it not? There's only one other person called Demetrius in the New Testament, and it's in Acts 19 in Ephesus, where Demetrius the silversmith is in making all this money, making shrines to Diana or Artemis. He raises this great big riot against Paul, and Paul has to flee. You don't read any more in Acts about Demetrius. And I'm going to suggest, it, you might think it's wacky, but okay, you can think that, I don't mind. Demetrius was in Ephesus. From where did John write these letters? Well, the Bible does not say, I accept that, but there is very strong church tradition that John wrote them from Ephesus. That tradition is in terms of letters and writings. Irenaeus, for example, very clear about this. A number of the early writers are clear about it. Church tradition, you've got to be pretty leery of it when it comes to doctrine, to theology, but in terms of basic history, probably it's not that far off. The connections between John and Ephesus are very strong in the writings and the history of the time. Also, if you go to Ephesus, I've been there a number of times baptizing uh, refugee folks there, it's just on the, on, on the coast there. In, uh, in Turkey. Well, yeah, there's a grave of John. There's a big lot of stuff about John. And there is stuff there going back, dated back to the first century that definitely states that John was there. Well, what you do know about John from Revelation 1.9 is that he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And where's Patmos? Just off the coast of Ephesus. If you were a naughty boy in Ephesus and they didn't cut your head off, they put you on a boat and sent you to, to the island, to Patmos. It's not, not far at all from Ephesus. 
So, yeah, I can accept that John was in Ephesus. I accept it's not in black and white in the Bible, but I think it's a fairly strong connection there. Right. And who was in Ephesus? What happened in Ephesus? Demetrius, the silversmith. That might, might not sound very uh, persuasive of itself, but it is the bit that persuaded me. Um, verse 12, Demetrius has the witness of all and of the truth itself. I scratched my head about that. When I wrote my verse by verse on John's letters, I had to, you know, write something about this verse, didn't I? What does that mean? And I thought about the word witness, which is definitely connected with the witness of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the truth himself, the truth itself, the truth himself. The truth is Jesus in John's writings, the way, the truth and the life. And in my, the first uh, take on, on my first edition of my verse by verse on this, I, I, I said something to the effect that, well, clearly there had been some special dramatic uh, testimony from the Holy Spirit or from the Lord Jesus about Demetrius, that this person is genuine. But I didn't join the dots and see the picture because it's all so random. Why, why just say this? We'll start talking about Demetrius. Oh, by the way, now I'm talking about Demetrius now. Um, yeah, there was a special testimony from the Holy Spirit through the Lord Jesus himself uh, that Demetrius is, is genuine. Yeah. Uh, why? Why just start talking about that? And I, I just assumed, oh, well, I guess that was just some local private issue of no particular significance to us. The Bible is all significant to us, just that we don't put it all together at times. Well, look, if this Demetrius is the only other Demetrius in the Bible, which is the one of Acts 19.24, the silversmith at Ephesus who raises the riot against Paul, yeah, if he then converted, everyone would have thought, what, Demetrius has become a Christian? I don't think so. Is Saul also among the prophets? But there was, it seems then, a special witness of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus himself through the Holy Spirit that said Demetrius is a good guy. And John says, yes, we also testify, and you know that our witness is true. John's saying, I know him, and I'm also testifying. He's the, he's the real deal. It's a good one, Demetrius. Right, so back to 11. Do not imitate such evil. Don't imitate diatrophies, but imitate he that is good. He that does good, Demetrius, is of, good, is of God. He that does evil, Diotrephes, has not seen God. Not a, doesn't have a relationship with God. But follow Demetrius. So I think he's saying to Gaius, look, don't follow Demetrius. Don't follow Diotrephes. Follow Demetrius. And there you see the huge power of the Lord Jesus to change things, to change people. We all tend to feel, I am absolutely hemmed in in life, hemmed in by my own personality, by my own history, by my own background. I can't change. I want to be like this. I don't want to be like this. I want to be like that and not like this. But, but, but I'm just hemmed in. That's how it feels. I can't change. People are addicted to all sorts of different things. They are set in a groove of psychological life, of thinking, of thought, and behavior, and so on. This is where Jesus changes people. This is how men and women who came into this hall where I am standing here as alcoholics and drug addicts quit and changed. This is one reason our church here grew in the way that it did because of the testimony and the example of men and women who really did stop drinking and other people like, how'd you do it? Ah, it's not going to some church. It's soup kitchen, you know, a soup kitchen up there in Edwards and Dye. Yeah, they, they do a church, I like go to church and all that. You know, I got baptised in that. I got a bathtub down the side of the soup kitchen. Yeah. You can change. I can change. We are not inevitable sinners. We are not inevitably in a groove of, of this or that or the other. We can change. Look at Demetrius, and even if you think I'm, you know, just seeing things about Demetrius. I mean, okay, look at Saul of Tarsus. Look, look at all the people we know did change. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. Look at all sorts of big-time sinners who changed. 
And that change, that same power of change, of, of deep transformation, is available to us today. And this is the whole point of our continual engagement with Jesus on the cross. Because it is he there and his example, his passion for us, the gift of his life, of his spirit, breathed out towards us in his last breath. It is that which transforms. It is that which changes men and women. It is that that breaks the groove, that breaks the addiction, that breaks the circle. That is the circuit breaker. And we come to him now. Engaging with him, wanting him in our lives. And that quite simply, in its simplest term, is what taking this bread and wine represents. That he is for us the truth. The way, the life, nothing else but. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for Jesus. For this bread in which we see the symbol of his body. And Father, we want him in us and for us to abide in him through his spirit. And we pray earnestly for that. That we might be transformed that we might be deeply changed and follow him as the way, the truth and the life, both now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this wine in which we see the symbol of the blood of your Son. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will forgive us our sins, that you will blot them out, and that your continual grace to us and your continual abiding total forgiveness might of itself change us. And that again, Father, your Son might be the truth, in which we walk. But please hear us and strengthen us, Father, for his sake, for the sake of all that he was, is, and ever shall be. 